for your wonderful time of learning and growing with him. Um, so, so brothers and sisters, um, I'm going to pray and I'm going to hand over to Pastor Bafana, who is going to explain to us what is the Academy of Theology. Maybe you're wondering, what is this Academy of Theology? I'm going to hand over to Pastor Bafana, the president, to, head, to explain what is the Academy of Theology um, after I had prayed. And then afterwards, uh, he's going to hand over to me. And then hopefully by then, uh, Dr. Damina would have uh, logged in. He did say he's going to be five minutes late. Um, hopefully by then he would have logged in and then we can continue with the webinar. But it's good to see brothers. I see Pastor, uh, Pastor Msiza is there. Um, good to have you, brother. I see Pastor uh, Shange is there. Uh, good to have you, men of God. We welcome you, sir. Uh, I see Pastor Johannes is there. Uh, we also welcome you, sir. And obviously my wonderful wife is also joining us uh, from home as well. Good to have you guys. Let me pray and then I am going to hand over to Pastor Bafana to do the introduction of what is the Academy of Theology uh, and then we'll continue. Father, we thank you for this time that you have given us. Lord, we are so humbled and so thankful that you have chosen us as sinners, Lord, to be recipients of your grace. Baba uh, Siagbonga, it's so heavy, it's so tough as we see the world being hopeless, as we see, you know, people being affected by this pandemic and people being affected by all kinds of things around, um, you know, uh, the church and around uh, false teachings and all of those things. We are hurt. We are bothered by that as, as South Africans, Lord, as Africans. Uh, we want to see your church being healthy. We want to see your church grow. We want to see, oh God, your church looking more and more like Jesus. We want to see your church multiplying and fulfilling its commission that you have given us. We love your church. We're so passionate to see, oh God, as under shepherds, as those you have put in charge, oh God, of your people to see, oh God, the right application of the word of God. So now we pray that, Lord, as we are about to start this, may it glorify you. Let no man receive glory. We're asking that, Father, um, that people may be helped by this, that people may be strengthened by this, people may be taught by this, that, oh God, um, we pray for Dr. Damina as well um, on his absentia as, he, as he's getting ready to also come, that be with him, Lord, that may give him wisdom to be able to explain to us and, and, and tell us, oh God, about this issue that's facing us here in Africa. And, and we pray for wisdom, we pray for humility, we pray, God, that you may help us to be open-minded and to, to open our hearts to listen to what you have to say to us, to receive that which you have for us that is coming from you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I am now going to hand over to Pastor Bafana who's going to explain what is the Academy of Theology. Um, Umbali, please give me an, indic an indication when uh, Dr. Damina has is in the room let me know that he has uh, we can now hand over to him um so that we are we are away thank you okay would it be okay for this if i just cut you in as soon as he's in sorry if you what you want me to voice it out or how do you want me to signal to you that he's in all right um yeah you can just you guess you can just send it to our group and let me know that he's in yeah okay yeah okay Pastor Bafana. Uh, Pastor Bafana, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear you? I don't know what's happened here, but uh, yeah, you can let me... You can go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Hey. Let me greet you all uh, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and and sisters who are, who are here. My name is Bafana Shabalala, and we I'm the president of the Academy of uh, Theology. And uh, we have established this uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 to 23, where Paul said, I, I will be a Jew to a Jew and all that. That uh, is our verse that we use, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 to 27. The purpose is one, we are intentionally contextualizing Christianity in African context. What do I mean by that? We are helping Africans uh, 
uh, to correctly apply biblical principle in their context. So that's what we are intentionally contextualizing Christianity in, Afri in African context. Also number two, we are encouraging reading and writing of biblical literature by African authors. What do we mean by that? We mean that uh, we need more literatures from our own who can write on our perspective, who can write in the context of African people and also especially with the languages that we speak, whether it's Tswana and all our languages. We, en we, we want to encourage that. We have partners with um, publishers uh, of OSIS who wants to promote writers who are pastors who write with things that affect us. Issues of uh, divorce, demo, um, uh, uh, dreams, deliverance, and all those issues that affect our people in a Christian perspective. How do we address that in a way that we understand them? Number three, we also encourage and promote resources that will intentionally address issues biblical faced by African. There's a lot of issues that we need to address we as the academy want to do that. And how do we do that through what we have started today with the webinars, we will be having webinars every month just to address those issues concerning what is happening in our township and everything. Thirdly, uh, fourthly, just to train pastors in their context of rural, of uh, township in cities and suburban ministry how to minister in those area because that is a different location. So we want to train those pastors in the future, how to minister in those um, contexts. And lastly, we are intentionally uh, gonna use mission field in people's language where we want to reach people. Our task is to preach the gospel to the people that are close to us who are near in that area. And that's what the Academy of Theology is, is uh, what we want to achieve is to do that, is to take ownership of the gospel and therefore send it to the people as it is and address the issues at the hands that people face. That's what we are. And we are intentionally focusing on African issues, even our people uh, in, in general. I think uh, <clears throat> Pastor Spoo will add that and also, Lastly, just to use the mission field of our township, of our ruler, we as people to go there and also evangelize our own people with the same gospel, with an understanding of where they are in their context value, so that we cannot dilute Christianity in any form of anything. That's what we are. And we want to work alongside with a lot of pastors, a lot of Christians across Christianity in Africa, internationally, and to address those issues. Thank you very much. Pastor Spoo, over to you. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Bafana. Um, I see a lot of a lot of people have um, are here. If um, if Dr. Tamina is part of this, and I'm not recognizing the phone, maybe he can he can comment uh, Batumbali. It's like, I don't see him having joined yet, right? No, he hasn't. He hasn't joined yet. Yeah, we're still uh, waiting for him. He did say that he's going to be a couple of minutes late. So we're waiting for him to, to join the webinar. But uh, we just want to welcome everyone. I see some pastors coming in. Please be patient with us. Um, hopefully, we're not going to have any network problems or anything like that. You know, being in Africa, uh, yeah, I know that Nigeria sometimes has power issues. We also here, we've got power issues with ESCOM. But we believe that... Um, Tonight, I think uh, we won't have those kinds of problems that everything is gonna go well. So we're just waiting for um, Dr. Damina just to, to come up here at um, a late meeting that he had to attend. And um, so we'll just um, wait for him to, to kind of uh, come. Um, yeah, so in the meantime, whilst maybe we are waiting, I'm going to attempt maybe to play a couple of his videos. I will explain and introduce him formally um, who he is. He has uh, sent us his CV. But I just want to play, because some of you are asking the question, who is this man? We do not know him. We've never heard of him. Um, some of the flavor of some of the teachings that maybe he is doing. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attempt to play some of his stuff. Um, 
I'm going to share it now as we are waiting for him. But as soon as he comes, um, please let me know so that I can hand over to him. is not supposed to innovate. A preacher is supposed to excavate the scriptures into the mind of the author to discover what the author's intent was in writing the text. A preacher is not supposed to superimpose his opinion, idea, or his perspective to the scriptures. He's supposed to go into the mind of the author Yes, um, I'm just about to share some of his other other stuff that is uh, his teaching. Whilst we are still uh, kind of waiting for him. Okay. As animals, we are faithfully given. I don't teach tithes, but I teach about the tithes. And I do not teach that people should pay tax. I'm not going to stop in tax. I cannot stop a Christian from giving tax. Because that means if your generosity is 10%, I cannot say don't give your 10%. That is the limit of your generosity or the revelation of your stinginess. That out of 100%, when you imagine the work of God and the goodness of God, the space your heart can create for God is 10%. It's a revelation of your stingy. Because if people under the blood of God and animals were faithfully giving 10%, then somebody under the finished work of Christ, which they without us could not be perfect. You two are struggling with them within the fire of them. It's either you or your to whom much is given, much is given. See that? And that's the revelation of the New Testament. The revelation of the New Testament destroys self. It makes you selfless. The revelation of the New Testament brings out of you an expression of extravagant love. The same way you receive from God is the same way you release to the brethren. That's what this revelation does. That's what it does. And a lot of pastors think we're advocating stinginess, but they don't even know that they are the ones advocating stinginess. We are actually the ones advocating extravagant giving because how do you box Christians within the confines of 10% with the love of God shared abroad in their hearts by the Holy Ghost? How do you live in that? In Acts of the Apostles, people sold lands and houses and brought everything. Why? New Testament. Nobody paid tithe in the book of Acts. In the entire transitioning of the church, as low as they were in Revelation, with all their cross-testamental application, that is one application they never carried over. They never carried over tithing. Never. Because the first thing the love of God does to a man is that your heart is taken over. Your heart, except you don't know what it means to be born again, except you don't know who Christ is to you, that is when you will be counting. Father, I give you, you give me. If I give you, you don't give me. I will not give again until the day you give me. No, you are not in a relationship. You are in a transaction. You are in a business. You are not in a relationship with God. Because if you're in a relationship with God, it's not about I 
give you, you give me. It is about you are giving me all that I ever needed. There's nothing I can ever do that will be enough. So I keep doing my best in response to have only give them according to Abraham or Moses. You didn't hear that. Do not give it according to Abraham or Moses, whether before the law or after the law or both of them. We are never told to copy or do or live like Abraham. Never. Nowhere in the Bible. In fact, Hebrews 1, verse 1, we are foreseen. We also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, including Abraham, including Moses. They are compassed about. Let us lay aside every way is and the sin that does easily beset us. And let us run the race with patience that is set before us. Look at the next verse. Looking unto Jesus. Looking there in the Greek is look away from Moses. Look away from Abraham. Look away from them. Look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of faith. So the writer of Hebrews says, look away from Abraham. Because if you look at Abraham, you will live in shadows. If you look at Abraham, you will function in shadows. Look away from shadows. Look away from types. Look at the reality, Jesus, because he is the substance of what they hoped for. He is the evidence of what they were waiting to see or what they never saw. Jesus is that reality. Jesus is that reality. Somebody said to me, Dr. Damina, I love all your teachings except that one on time. Except that one on time. I say, even that one on time, it is because you have not understood it. Because if you understand it, you will preach it more than me. Yeah, you will preach it more than me. Oh, yeah, I'm telling you. There's nothing like extravagant giving in the church until you allow believers to give generously. As long as you're controlling believers with a cane, with tight card, tight book, tight record, and you use it to be monitoring them like a monitoring spirit. They will trick you and play you. Because it's why your man die, why your man bury him. Somebody emphatically told me, say, Dr. Damina, I don't believe in your titan teaching, no. But let me be honest with you, I have never been faithful in my church. After all, my pastor doesn't know my income. I just removed the one I can give because my tights are heavy. So I just cut some because the money would be too much if I give it to our church. So I just cut a little and give it. And they are happy because it's consistent. But I know that I'm not faithful. I'm just being honest with you. Okay, brothers and sisters, there's just a flavor of some of what um, Pastor Bishop um, Damina um, is, teaches. And um, we really thought he would be a really appropriate person to come and interact with. As um, you know, he, I believe he's the, he's the man of this hour and really speaks truth. To Africa, not just um, not just Nigeria, and and um, if I can have an indication if he is able to join in, I'm also trying to talk to his secretary. Uh, from everything, it looks everything like he's still fine. I'm not sure um, uh, if he's hearing us or he's he's around. If maybe there's a phone I don't recognize here. I know that Nigeria, we did uh, talk to him. I know that they are one hour behind us. Uh, and so we are one hour ahead. And there was a late meeting that he had that he sent that he's going to be a bit late, that he won't, um, he will be five minutes late. But I guess we should also give him some grace. Maybe there was an emergency that happened. Maybe he's running just a bit late. So Bazalane, if we can just be a bit patient, I'm asking for just a bit patience as we try to just get hold of him and his secretary to make sure that we connect with him. But if you are hearing that for the first time about tithing and it's making uncomfortable, please do not log off. <laughs> please do not log off. Uh, some of you, I see some of you are getting scared, are getting nervous. Please do not log off. We ask when we pray to say, be humble. Let us open up our hearts and open up our minds. We wanna talk about, especially with him, the issue of prosperity 
uh, preaching in Africa. It's very relevant. It's very, I mean, sorry, it's very prevalent in our continent. And I believe he has spoken on it in some of his messages. He has taught on it. And I believe there's something that we can learn on it. And this is one of the stuff that he says and one of the teachings that he teaches on the issue of, of tithing. Um, and so if, it's, if you're hearing it for the first time, I'm asking that you keep on listening. Um, uh, hopefully, as we begin to uh, hear what he has to say, we might ask him around that. So I'm just asking for a bit of patience while we try to connect with his secretary so we can uh, connect with him. Uh, Sbu? Yes, yes, uh, Pastor Lofan. Why don't we, um, if, if you allow me just to add some few things concerning us, sure. so that those who, who want uh, us as the Academy of Theology can like our page. We will send a lot of information there. And then if you have some question concerning it also, and you didn't understand, you can also write an email at info, uh, info dot the a the a theo, uh, dot org. That's where you can write something. But uh, we are intentionally we want to contextualize Christianity in our African context to address issues that are not addressed, and most issues that sometimes we have never learned from the school seminar that we see on the ground, but address them biblically and to help our African brothers and sisters also to be biblical in addressing the issues of life, the principle that is at the hands. So Academy of Theology is there to assist them. And those who want to write books as pastors, and we want to help them. We want to connect them. We have one publisher, Oasis, that has opened doors for us, for writers, to come and write in, um, in an African context, what we, they need those authors, but they must be sound, they must be biblical. And, if, and therefore we need them to contact us also so that we can connect them with Oasis. And when you write for Oasis, you don't pay upfront. You don't submit any money, you submit your manuscript, what you have written, they assess it and they will tell you what to correct. And it is them who's gonna publish your book who's gonna organize your book in a complete form and you're gonna be rewarded when your book now started to hit the shelf somewhere in Africa or with us. And also one of the yeah. things the academy- I just got a message from the, the secretary that he's joining us. So maybe okay. we okay. can just wrap up maybe the last 15 seconds and then we'll, we'll then uh, introduce him properly and then we'll hand over to him, but you can just wrap up. Yeah, let me wrap up with this. Um, another idea of the Academy of Theology, we are on the resource side where we want to promote books and reading and those who write and in African context. And it is one of the idea that we will be distributing books everywhere. Even if you are a writer and you write something, you publish yeah. a book, contact I'm us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Subo. I don't know if he's joining and then I'll add the announcement at the end so that we don't delay. All right, awesome. Thank you guys for your patience. I um, appreciate you guys um, waiting for this. This is uh, worth the wait. I know that some are still logging in, some are still joining. Uh, let me just connect with uh, Dr. Damina. Doctor, Doctor, can you hear us? Loud and clear, I can hear you. Powerful, powerful. Uh, if you don't mind maybe switching your video on, I'm about to hand over to you now. I'm just going to explain the structure of how we are going to work, and then I'll hand over to you. But let me just introduce Dr. Damina. Um, this is a very, uh, this is kind of a long CV, <laughs> but uh, it's important to know the, the, the credentials and the quality of the person that we have speaking to us. The founder and president of Able Damina Ministries International and CEO of Home Life. A Christian. <laughs> Uh, the, 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 who's having a background noise, is it? Okay. Dr. Damina is the founder and president of Able Damina Ministries International, CEO of Kingdom Life Network, a Christian satellite TV channel. He's the senior pastor of Power City International with extension campuses across the globe, 
president of International Covenant and Ministers Association, a body that provides covering and ministerial resources for ministerial of the gospel worldwide. He's also the president of Abel Damina Online Mentoring Academy with mentees across the globe. Dr. Damina hosts the TV program Riotous Invasion of Truth, the Riot on the Kingdom Life Network and other stations through which millions are being transformed. He's a prolific writer and author of several books. He holds PhDs in philosophy and in ministry amongst other achievements and he travels around the globe to reintroduce Jesus Christ to this generation. I'm not gonna continue. We'll finish tomorrow if I continue naming his CV. But basically how we're gonna work, uh, brothers and sisters, I'm gonna hand over to him. And for the next, since I think we are about half an hour late already, we'll try and try so much to keep to the time. But for the next half an hour, I'm gonna to give to, over to Dr. Damina to give us an opening statement where he's gonna talk about the theme and the topic um, of what we have given him. And then afterwards, we are going to have interaction with him. And then I've got some pre-written questions that I wanna ask him. And then afterwards, we'll open up questions to the floor. So right now, I just wanna hand over to him to just uh, give us his opening address. Uh, Dr. Damina. Well, praise, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I'm so excited to be with the brethren in South Africa today. I want to appreciate the invitation from uh, brother, the brothers who invited me with the Theology Academy. And I'm excited. We have had a wonderful time of fellowshipping sorry, together. Sorry, Dr. Damina, would you mind just uh, maybe opening your camera if you can? If you can't, it's okay. Yeah. It will be open in a few minutes. It okay, will be thank open. you. Yeah. And I'm just glad to be with all of you this evening. And uh, what a blessing to be able to share fellowship with you. I'd like us to pray together as we get in the word. Father, we rejoice that we have the privilege of learning, the privilege of being equipped, the privilege of growing in grace, growing in knowledge, and abounding in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray today that everyone connected to this platform, men and women of God, people that you have raised, people of influence, people you've given a voice, to bring direction, to bring soundness and clarity of teaching to your people. Lord, I ask that as we spend the next few minutes together, revelation knowledge is gifted everyone. The eyes of your understanding flooded with light. You are strengthened with might by the spirit in the inner man. Father, we give you praise for answered prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God. All right, uh, when the brethren in South Africa approached me to share in this fellowship, I was given to a title on the prosperity gospel to look at what it is about, what's wrong with it, what's right with it, is it necessary, and how did our continent become a breeding place for it, what makes it popular in Africa, what is the true gospel, how can pastors preach the gospel properly, what are the tools you need to remember as you prepare for the work. All of these are the subject matters I'm supposed to cover. I will try as much as I can within the next few minutes to cover as much as I can, you know, with the subject. The subject is a huge subject. I know we can't cover a great deal of it today, but I will try to push as much as I can push within the next few minutes that I have available to me to share with you tonight. One of the most raging subjects of discourse in Christianity today borders on material wealth and its relationship or otherwise with the gospel. Without much ado, it appears that nothing has done so much to undermine the very foundations of the Christian faith as the issue of wealth, particularly in the way it is presented and emphasized. The overwhelming desire to be rich among both clergy and laity has pervaded both the teaching and practice of Christianity. And this seems to be probably in a bid to match the world with measures, success and significance mainly by the amount of money one has rather than the quality of his life. Pertinent questions in this regard are, how is material wealth related to being saved? Does getting saved affect a person's material possession? Does a person acquire more wealth because he is saved? Or does he lose the money because he is saved? Why people were rich in Bible times? Was it because they served God or because they did not? No doubt, the prevalent overemphasis on the subject of material wealth has further led to wrong, wrongful Bible interpretation to justify the position. This overemphasis comes majorly from ministers and the danger is believers who are driven by this line of teaching face are numerous including 
but not limited to lack of interest in Bible study, a general malpractice of the faith, and the eventual commalization of the gospel of Christ. The effect of all of these issues I have mentioned about money, material wealth, and all of it to the gospel of Christ must be clearly understood. Any lack of understanding has grave implications to the believer. It cannot be left to speculations or assumptions. The truth is, if one's interpretation of the Bible is wrong, his worship cannot be right. If your interpretation of the Bible is wrong, your worship cannot be right because worship is predicated on proper Bible interpretation. Worship is predicated on proper Bible interpretation. A golden rule in Bible interpretation is scriptures can never mean what they never meant when they were reading. Scriptures can never mean today what they never meant when they were reading. No one is given the right to interpret scriptures in his own way. You must arrive at the same interpretation of the truth. This is very important in interpretation of texts of scriptures. I repeat, the scriptures can never mean today what they never meant when they were first written. The reason for dutiful and diligent study of the scriptures cannot be overemphasized. Paul stated this clearly in his second epistle to Timothy. Second Timothy chapter two, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Notice the words he used in the above text. Number one, study. Number two, show. Number three, approved. Number four, workman. Number five, ashamed. Number six, rightly dividing. Number seven, word of truth. Let us examine them one after the other. The word study was translated from the Greek word spudazo. It's spelled as A-S-P-O-U-D-A-Z-O, spudazo. It implies to be eager. In other words, be diligent to make every effort. Paul used the same word again in the same epistle. Second Timothy chapter four, verse nine. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Second Timothy chapter four, verse 21. Do thy diligence to come before winter. You bullocks greeted thee and Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brethren. So it means make every effort. That means one has a duty, a responsibility to make every effort in proper interpretation of the scriptures. He used it also in his letter to Titus. Titus chapter three, verse 12. When I shall send Atamas unto thee, or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. So the word study is the word spudazo, which means diligent or make every effort. Then there's another word there, the word to show, show, show. The word show was translated from the Greek word Paristemai, paristemai is spelled as P-A-R-I-S-T-E-M-I, for those making notes, paristemai. It implies to stand beside or to exhibit. It was used also in the same book once. Second Timothy chapter four, verse 17. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of lion. The word approved was translated from the Greek word dokimos. Dokimos is spelled as D-O-K-I-M-O-S. Dokimos implies to be tried, to be tested and tried for something. Then there is another phrase, unto God, was actually translated from a single word in the Greek, theos. Theos, which simply means God. Hence, what Paul said can be better understood as, you have been approved of God. Make effort 
to exhibit this fact. That's what brother Paul was saying to Timothy. You have been approved of God. Make effort to exhibit this fact. Then there is another word, the word ashamed, was translated from the Greek word episkunumai. Episkunumai is spelled as E P A I S C H U N O M A I. It relates to someone being able to identify with something. In this particular letter to Timothy, Paul used it several times. Second Timothy chapter one, verse eight. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Brother Paul also used it in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. He also used it in 2 Timothy 1, 16. The Lord give me mercy, the Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. Other references of the word ashamed will be Mark chapter 8, verse 38. It means to identify with. Hence, it is not just about shame or feeling bad about something. It is to identify with. In Luke chapter 9, verse 26, it says, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he shall come in his own glory, and in his fathers, and of the holy angels. Then brother Paul used that same word ashamed in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Romans chapter 6 verse 21 also has the word ashamed. Romans chapter 6 verse 21. What fruit had he then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. It is to say that you can identify with something openly. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 11. Brother, the writer of Hebrews puts it like this. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 16, it says, But now they desire a better country that is unheavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he had prepared for them a city. Then there is another term, rightly dividing. Rightly dividing. Was translated from the Greek word, Ototomio, ototomio, O R T H O T O M E O. It was derived from two words, otos and temno. It means to cut a straight line, to cut through, to dissect. It implies to dig or to mine. It is usually used for those who were involved in looking for something. In other words, Brother Paul used the word ototomio to imply taking the scriptures from Genesis to Malachi and cut through it carefully like a miner does for the word of truth. And cut through it carefully like a miner does for the word of truth. So in interpreting the word of truth, which is the Old Testament, Genesis to Malachi, we do not innovate, we excavate. We excavate like a miner to bring out the word of truth. So what is truth? What is truth? John 14, 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. This shows that the truth is a person. In John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus said to the Jews of his day, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. This shows that Bible study should be centered around the person of Christ. And the end point of every Bible study will be to reveal Christ, to reveal Christ. Jesus' explanation in Luke chapter 24, verse 25 to 27 is indicative of this. Then said he unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. 
ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. In explaining this, let us look at some terms that was used. The word believe, the word believe was translated from the Greek word pistio. And for those making notes, it's spelled as P-I-S-T-E-U-O, P-I-S-T-E-U-O. It implies to rely upon or to trust. It was used 240 times in the New Testament books of the Bible. Jesus' use of this word shows that what the prophet spoke was for faith. Jesus referred to all that the prophets have spoken. And he qualified what he meant by all that the prophets have spoken in his preceding statements. He limited it to the things they spoke about the sufferings of Christ and the glory that you follow. So the prophets in Genesis to Malachi spoke about Christ. Please, that's critical. The prophets from Genesis to Malachi spoke about Christ. That means that Jesus in interpreting the scriptures for the first time, because nobody has been able to interpret the scriptures until Jesus showed up. So the message was the first to interpret the message. And there was a bias in his interpretation of the scriptures. That bias was himself. The things in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So Jesus, therefore, is the explanation of all things. Jesus is the revelation of the scriptures. Jesus is the message of the scriptures. If you read the Bible and you can't find Jesus, you have not read well. Anywhere you read in the Bible and you cannot find Jesus, you have not read. If you read the Bible and you see marriages and you don't see Jesus, you didn't read. If you read the Bible and you see wars and you didn't see Jesus, you have not read. If you read the Bible and you see killings and you didn't see Jesus, you have not read. Because the scriptures have a bias. The scriptures have a singular revelation. That revelation is the person of the Christ. Hence, Jesus interprets the scripture. Jesus unveils the scripture. Jesus is the logic, the logos. Jesus is God's thinking pattern. Jesus is not God's errand boy. Jesus is not God's messenger. Jesus is not speaking for God. Jesus is God speaking for himself. Jesus is the revelation of God. Jesus is the revelation of God. So now we want to look at quickly what is the prosperity gospel about. With the need to define what the gospel is not, the prosperity gospel, it is important, first of all, to define from the scriptures what the gospel is. Because if we know what the gospel is, then we can quickly decipher the prosperity gospel. The word gospel was translated from the Greek word euagelion, euagelion, E-U-A-G-G-E-L-I-O-N, euagelion. It implies a good message. In the verb form, it was translated from the word euagelizo, euagelizo. For those making notes, E-U-A, double G, E-L-I-Z-O, which implies to announce the good news, to bring or declare glad tidings. It was used 52 times. It is vital to note that the phrase, the gospel, always has a qualifying adjective to define it. Anywhere you see the gospel, it always has a qualifying adjective to define it. You are Jeleon. You are Jeleon. For those making notes, E U A double G E L I O N. You are Jeleon. It was used as a noun 74 times in the New Testament books of the Bible. In the four Gospels, it was used 12 times. 
And for those who are making notes, Matthew 26 verse 13 calls it this gospel. Matthew 26 13, this gospel. Mark chapter 1 verse 1 calls it the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mark chapter 1 verse 1, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mark chapter 1 verse 14 calls it the gospel of the kingdom of God. Mark chapter 1 verse 14, the gospel of the kingdom of God. Mark chapter 16 verse 15 calls it the gospel. The gospel. Observe how it was described. It was described as the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom of God, the gospel, this gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So in the four gospels, the phrase, the gospel, was not used for anything material. It was not used for anything material. I go over the, the way it was described. The gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom of God, the gospel, this gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it was not used for anything material in the four gospels. In the book of Acts, it was used two times in the book of Acts. Acts 15, 7. Acts 15, 7. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago, God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth shall hear the word of the gospel and believe. Shall hear the word of the gospel and believe. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. But none of these things move me, neither counter my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel of the grace of God. Observe the adjectives used. The word of the gospel and the gospel of the grace of God. So observe in the four gospels, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom of God, this gospel the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then look at the way it was used in the book of Acts. Word of the gospel, the gospel of the grace of God. In the book of Romans, look at the way it was described. First mention, Romans 1.1, 1, 1, the gospel of God. The gospel of God. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Observe that the element of the believing is on the lordship and the resurrection of Jesus. So the word utterance of faith is on the lordship and the resurrection of Jesus. Utterance of faith. In verse 11, Romans chapter 10, verse 11. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him, shall not be ashamed. Brother Paul quoted that scripture from Isaiah 28, verse 16. Take note of the word, believe on him. In this context, we'll refer to the person of Jesus and his resurrection. Believe on him. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word call was translated from the Greek word epikaliomai. It's spelled as P-E-P-I-E-P-I-K-A-L-E-O-M-A-I. Epikaliomai, which implies to testify or to invoke a decision. This emphasizes the response of faith to the word of faith. Verse 14 and 15 of Romans chapter 10 says, how then shall they call on him? Please underline the word him. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him, him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? The key words here are believe and heard. Believe and heard. 
The word herd was translated from the Greek word akao, A-K-O-U-O, which implies to give audience to a report, to give audience to a report. In this instance, it refers to the report of the Lordship and the resurrection of Christ. So now Paul explained that the report must be preached and heard. Hence, there is need for a preacher. Romans chapter 10, verse 16 and 17 now says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who had believed our report? So then, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word obeyed was translated from the Greek word hupakao. Hupakao is spelled as H-U-P-A-K-O-U-O, which implies to heed or conform to an instruction. Verse 16 was quoted from Isaiah 53 verse 1, which was explained earlier in the previous explanation. The word hour was translated from the Greek word hemon, H-E-M-O-N which implies a certain company of people. In this context, Isaiah was referring to the reports of the prophets. The word report was translated from the Greek word akao, A-K-O-E, which implies a hearing, a rumor, or fame, or published information. The information published is the report of Christ's lordship and resurrection. Hence, Brother Paul's submission in verse 17 of Romans 10. The word comet in that text was italicized. This implies it was not inserted by the translators of the King James Version. I mean, it was inserted by the translators of the King James Version of the books of the Bible. So it can be better understood as faith is by hearing. That is, faith is by the report. Faith is by hearing. Hearing the message of Christ. Hearing the message of Christ. Look at the way Brother Paul will communicate the same thoughts to the church in Corinth. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Observe how brother Paul highlighted the facts of the gospel. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Key observation, according to the scriptures. That's key, according to the scriptures. Recall, the phrase, the scriptures, refers to the books of the Old Testament. This seems to show that the report of faith in the Old Testament was the report of the facts of death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Those are the facts in the Old Testament that we call the report. However, Brother Paul focused on the resurrection as paramount in the presentation of the gospel of Christ. Hence, his submission in the subsequent text of that scripture. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 14 and 17. Verse 14 says, And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you are yet in your sins. The gospel of Christ is definite in its presentation of the facts of Jesus' resurrection. Very definite. Hence, the message of Jesus is unmistakable and unambiguous in its facts. And as we will see, It has nothing to do with a promise of material possession. Let me repeat quickly. The gospel of Christ is definite in its presentation of the facts of Jesus' resurrection. Hence, the message of Jesus 
is unmistakable and unambiguous in its facts. As we will see, it has nothing to do with a promise or a guarantee of material possession. We will see believers who are either rich or poor in material possession. And the fact that no believer has exemptions from industry as a means of financial prosperity. It is vital to note that there were strong apostolic warnings concerning the preaching of another gospel in the epistles. There were strong apostolic warnings concerning the preaching of another gospel in the epistles. Observe the following instructions by Brother Paul. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 to 9. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. In verse six, I marvel that you are so soon removed. The word removed was translated from the Greek word metatithemai. Metatitemai is spelled as M-E-T-A-T-I-T-H-E-M-I. It implies to change sides, to pervert. It was used five times in the New Testament text of the books of the Bible. It is the same word that was translated as turning in the text below. Jude 1, 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares. Jude chapter 1, verse 4. There are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men, turning the grace of our Lord God into unto lasciviousness and denying the only Lord and our Lord Jesus Christ. The word another was translated from the Greek word heteros, H-E-T-E-R-O-S, H-E-T-E. ROS. It implies different, altered, or strange. Another, different, altered, or strange. In verse 7, there is another word, the word another, was translated from the Greek word alos. Alos. It implies another of the same sort. Another of the same sort. Bringing this into context, Brother Paul was saying that the strange gospel. was not another of the same. It is a strange gospel. It is strange gospel. Please pay attention. It, it, it means that it is a troubling gospel. Brother Paul said, but there'll be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. The word trouble was translated from the Greek word taraso. T-A-R-A-S-S-O. It implies to steer or agitate. It was used 17 times for information received by sight or hearing that causing a steering or an agitation. The word pervert was translated from the Greek word metastrepho, metastrepho. It implies to transmute or corrupt. So in this context, oh, it implies to corrupt the gospel of Christ to corrupt the gospel of Christ. Verse eight, Brother Paul says, let him be accursed. The word accursed was translated from the Greek word anathema. It implies to ban, excommunicate or separate from. Hence, this emphasizes the instructional warning against another gospel. That is, that which perverts the facts of the gospel earlier explained. I begin to round off for the purpose of today's session. What is received upon faith in Christ? Well, 
When one believes in Christ, what he receives is number one, eternal life. John 6, 47. He receives eternal life. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. John 3, 15 and 16. John 3, 15 and 16. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.36, John 3.36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. John 20.31, John 20.31. Believing you might have life through his name. Sonship, sonship. So what you receive, number one, is eternal life. Number two, sonship, John 1.12. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. The third thing is remission and forgiveness of sins. What you receive upon faith in Christ. Remission and forgiveness of sins. Acts 10, 43. Whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. The next thing is justification and righteousness justification and righteousness acts 13 39 and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of moses they could not have been justified by the law of moses but by faith in christ the next thing you receive is the spirit of god john 7 39 but this key of the spirit which they that believe on him shall receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Galatians 3.14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So when a man believes the gospel, he is sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Thus, faith in Christ, therefore, is forgiveness of sins. Faith in Christ is forgiveness of sins. It is eternal life. It is justification. It is the indwelling of the spirit. And it means that the believer is a son. The believer is a son. The moment a man believes the gospel that is what he receives he receives the forgiveness of sins he receives eternal life he receives justification he receives the indwelling of the spirit and he becomes a son of god that is what the gospel of christ offers that is what the gospel of christ offers outside of that will be another which is not another. Brother Paul calls it a perversion, another gospel, which is not another. And ladies and gentlemen, the moment a man believes the gospel, he becomes a son of God. From that moment, you are quickened together with Christ, raised up together with Christ, made to sit together with Christ. The Greek word together is the word sukatizo. It means you will never find one without the other. Wherever Christ is, is where you are. What he has, you have. What he can do, you can do. Why? Because of the substitutionary sacrifice. When he died, I died. When he was buried, I was buried. When he rose from the dead, I rose from the dead. Therefore, what he has belongs to the believer. Ladies and gentlemen, those are the facts of the gospel. The gospel is the gospel of Christ. The gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel is the gospel of a person. How shall they hear without a preacher? So the gospel, therefore, is communicated as the revelation of a person. Brother Paul calls it the gospel of Christ. That is what we preach. I believe that the next time I have more time with you, 
I'll be able to get into, you know, exp expatiating on the prosperity, what this prosperity gospel is all about. But of course, we can't get into that until we establish what is the gospel. It is when we understand what the gospel is that we can delve into prosperity. I have resources I would recommend for you for further reading. I wrote a book titled Bible Truth About Material Wealth. Bible Truth About Material Wealth. And I'm just going to read a little bit for you on that. Bible Truth About Material Wealth. At the back of the book, I have the subject of wealth and its relationship or otherwise with the gospel of Christ is a sensitive subject of discourse in today's Christianity. It appears that this subject has done so much to undermine the very fundamentals of the Christian faith because of the way it is explained and emphasized. So in this book, I consider subject as Jesus and wealth. Is Jesus against material wealth? What is Abraham's blessings? How a believer should view and use wealth, misconceptions about wealth, and a lot more. I wrote another book I recommend for you. Is the book, The Last Days. It's a doctrinal insight into the last days and its events. I mean, this book is, is, is spot on. It will, it will open up a lot of things for you that has to do with the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, seducing spirits who are false prophets, the resurrection of the dead, the revelation of God. I mean, this is sound theological material that opens up a whole lot of discourse on the subject of eschatology in the light of Christ. Then the last one I recommend for you today is a book I wrote recently on the office of the pastor. The office of the pastor. We examine the ethos of the office of the pastor. And we dealt with things like what is the church, the local church, who is a pastor, what are his responsibilities, how does he emerge in the local church, how does he relate with the flock, obedience, submission, accountability, and on and on in the local church. Let's pray together, Father. Thank you for these brethren in South Africa. Great men, great women of God. You are strategically positioned to influence, to build up people, raise up an army of people who know who they are in you, what they have in you, and what you can do through them. Lord, I pray for these great men. I ask that the revelation of your word continues to grow. The things we have discussed today by the Holy Ghost, I ask that you bring further light. Thank you, Lord, that as we continue to advance your cause all over the continent of Africa, we decree that this glorious light of the gospel is preached from the mountaintop to the valley. Lord, is preached from one part of Africa to the other, that this gospel of Christ, the true message of Christ, is proclaimed all over Africa. Falsehood loses ground. Falsehood collapses. In the name of Jesus, it collapses. Men and women are raised all over Africa to embrace the truth of the gospel of Christ. And we rejoice that the word of God continues to grow big all over Africa. And we thank you, Father, for the blessing upon this session of discourse and fellowship with these men and women of God. I give you praise for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. I'm so glad to be with all of you, brothers, uh, Super Ciso. And I want to, you know, introduce one of my, my my great friends who lives in South Africa with you people, I asked him to be in the conference tonight, Reverend James Bayana. He's here with us. He's been in the conference from the beginning. Uh, Reverend James is here and I'd like to you know, introduce him to you people and I'd like him to connect with you people. But it's just an honor and a joy to have spent these few minutes with you tonight looking at this great subject. Thank you again for having me. I must apologize, my camera has been off I'm just waiting for my staff to come and just help me factor it out. I don't know what I touched that made the, the, the you guys not to see me. I, I, I sincerely apologize, but I hope that before we're true, my staff will come and ratify it on this phone and get you to see my face. But I'm glad again and honored to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Damina. Can we all react with uh, claps and sharps just to appreciate the message that we've just heard? Um, for some, this is the, the rich food that they've, 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 they haven't had in a long time. Um, exegetically, theologically accurate, talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. What, a, what, a, what an encouragement to know that in Africa, we still have true ministers of the gospel. Um, doctor, if, if I can just, um, 
I just want to uh, just ask you some questions. Is that, is that okay if we can just uh, ask some questions? Absolutely, absolutely. Powerful, powerful. So let me, let me just pick up. And um, some of you have questions as well can uh, maybe prepare for that or maybe put it in the chat box. We'll try and look at them. We might give a chance for you to ask a question live. But from what you said, you gave us a, uh, a, a very rich, this is rich food. This, is, this was a buffet. <laughs> on, Thank you. Explaining what the gospel is. Um, talking also about the prosperity gospel. And I'm going to ask it in this way. I'm going to ask the question in this way. You ended by saying when a person receives Christ, he receives forgiveness of sins. He receives eternal life. He receives sonship. He receives remission of sins. He receives the promise of the Spirit. And I say, I say amen to that. Um, I want to ask about the, the, the adjective is obviously prosperity, you know, explaining the gospel. And you did the right thing, but, you know, they say that before you say what something is not, you must tell them what it is. You know, in the bank, people show people the right notes so that when they get a fake note, they know what it looks like. So you gave us what the true gospel is. Um, in, in asking my question, I want to ask, in, in your understanding, what are the pillars of the prosperity gospel? In other words, because somebody could be sitting here and listening and saying, amen, pastor, I, 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 I believe that. But they might not be aware what we're talking about when we talk about the prosperity gospel. In other words, what, what does the person, what does the prosperity gospel teach a person receives as opposed to what the true gospel says? What does it say a person receives when they accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? I trust my question is clear. Very clear, very clear. Let me give you a background because if you have the background, you'll be able to understand. I grew up in a pastor's house and I grew up with the uh, Assemblies of God Church. And when I grew up, all we knew was the gospel of the forgiveness of sins. And then as I began to grow in my Christian walk, I got involved with the faith movement. The faith movement has to do with Kenneth Hagin, the teachings of Brother Hagin, and all of the faith movement, all right? And then from the faith movement, I got into what we call the prosperity movement. Now the prosperity movement is a movement where you are taught that you can believe God for stuff. You can believe God for money. You can believe God to make wealth. You can give, and when you give God an offering, he can multiply the offering and give you back, all right? That's what the prosperity gospel is all about. It's all about giving to God to get. I can never do anything without expecting to get something back. So if I give an offering, God will have to multiply it and give it back to me, all right? And that is what the prosperity gospel is all about. It's a promise of a reward in turn for giving, in return for service. And so when believers now begin to come to church, they come with that expectation. They want to give and get. They want to give and receive. And I preached that gospel for quite a few years. And I was known all over my, my country in Nigeria. And over the continent of Africa, I was known as a prosperity preacher. I went everywhere preaching it until I discovered the emptiness in that gospel. And then I began to seek for the true gospel of Christ. And the Lord opened my eyes to the scriptures that I began to share with us tonight. That when you begin to realize the truth of the gospel of Christ, the gospel of Christ is focused on the forgiveness of sins. Because before Jesus came, people had money. So Jesus didn't come to give us money. Before Jesus came, people had houses. People had, you know, materials. They had wealth. They had money. They were rich people before Jesus came. So Jesus didn't come to give us money. The scriptures clearly state, she shall bring forth a song. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. Why? He shall save his people from their sin. He came to save man from sin. John the Baptist, the last prophet and the greatest prophet of the Old Testament, looking at Jesus said, behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. So the mandate of Jesus was very clear to solve what man does not have a cure for. And that is sin and bring man into sonship, into a place of an inseparable union with Almighty God. In a nutshell, that's the best I can give you as an answer for the now. Right. Uh, thank, thank you for that. Um, now, now, it seems, seems as you're saying, um, uh, Doctor, that the main thing when it comes to the prosperity gospel is the issue of money. It always goes back to the issue of money and material things. 
And you did say that the Jesus Christ didn't, the gospel does, didn't necessarily come to solve our, our material problem, but our sin problem. And so now this is my question. How do we, we live in Africa, right? We live in a place um, that, is, that is obviously, uh, you know, we are, we are poor financially, materially compared to the rest of the world. How, how, how do pastors balance uh, being biblical in terms of the, preaching the gospel versus addressing the material need of the people? How, how, how do pastors get a balance in terms of being spiritual, but also not being insensitive without going to the prosperity? How did Brother Paul and the apostles, because Christianity is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. How did the apostles, the apostles who laid the foundation of the New Testament, how did they preach the gospel? First of all, observe carefully. All the first messages in the book of Acts, the message on the day of Pentecost was centered on Christ died. He was buried on the third day, he rose. And this is that promise he promised us, the Holy Spirit. The second message that was preached in the book of Acts was the same thing. The Bible says, and daily in the temple and from house to house, they cease not to preach Christ. Stephen, in Acts chapter seven, the whole period he stood, he was only explaining Christ from the Old Testament. What about the, 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 the eunuch in Acts chapter eight? Bible says, and Philip beginning at the same scripture, preached Christ to him. What about Peter in the house of Cornelius? He preached Christ died, he was buried on the third day, he rose again. What about Pete, I mean Paul? Paul, in Acts chapter 13, Paul preached the forgiveness of sins which were received in Christ, which the law of Moses could not give. So the seven first apostolic sermons that laid the foundation of the New Testament church were centered on Christ and there was no promise of any material, material blessing given to anybody in the apostolic establishment of the New Testament. So how did they meet the needs of people in the early church? In Acts chapter 2, the Bible tells us that people gave, sold their lands, sold their houses, and gave as every man was able to give to support the work of God. So again, when people see Jesus, when a minister of the gospel truly reveals Jesus, when your emphasis is Christ, and when people see Christ, money loses value. Amen. Money loses value. You cannot see Jesus and still be worshiping money. You cannot serve God and mammon. The moment you see Jesus, money becomes an object for worshiping Jesus. It loses value. Look at the woman at the well. The Bible says Jesus told her to give him water. And she said, well, we have nothing in common. And Jesus said to her, if only you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked the water, you will have given me your water and I will give you living water. You never trust again. And then they kept discussing. The moment her eyes were open to see that this is Jesus, she gave him the bucket. She gave him the well. She went to the city and brought the city to Jesus. When people see Jesus, material stuff loses value. I mean, look at the man called uh, the tax collector, Zacchaeus. He was on a tree waiting to see Jesus. The moment Jesus saw him, he said, come down, Zacchaeus, today. Salvation is coming to your house. When they sat down in Zacchaeus' house, Jesus in the house of his sinner, when it dawned on Zacchaeus that this is Jesus, the desire of all nations, sitting with me in my house, when it dawned on him, he stood up. Everybody I have cheated, I pay times four. Friends, when you see Jesus, money loses value. So how do we train believers in, in the church? Well, first of all, Brother Paul apostolically instructed, let him that stole steal no more, Ephesians 4.28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, mm. the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needed. So we encourage brethren in church to get to the secular work world and get jobs, get businesses. And if they don't have skills, develop skills, go out there, and do what you need to do to make money out in the secular. That is the, the way the apostles taught people. They taught people to be industrious. They taught people to get involved in, you know, in, 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 in businesses. They taught people to get jobs and be productive with their lives and in turn support the work of God. That is how it works in the New Testament. Thank you. 
Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Just to remind the people that you also have a chance to ask a question. If you would like, you can ask it in the chat. Or if you would like to ask a live question, just um, on the reactions button, just raise up your hand and then I will acknowledge you uh, and be able to pick you up. Um, but whilst we're waiting for, for others to ask questions, um, here's, here, here's a, let me ask some pre-written questions that were sent to us um, and Bishop uh, by others. Um, here's, here's a question here. Um, distinguishing, uh, the distinguishing marks between Pentecostalism and the prosperity gospel. It seems Pentecostalism is a breeding ground for prosperity. Could you give the distinguishing marks between Pentecostalism and prosperity? Would you agree with that premise that the uh, Pentecostalism is a breeding ground for prosperity? What are the marks between genuine Pentecostalism and prosperity gospel? Well, that's going back to history. And if I delve into history right now, I don't think we have the time for it. And like I said, you know, when we're discussing pre this class, I wouldn't want to just uh, give teasers on very serious issues. For example, if I want to get into Pentecostalism and the distinguishing marks, I would have to give you the history, the background of Pentecostalism, how it all began and, you know, all of that. And how the prosperity gospel also began and how the prosperity gospel got into Pentecostalism. When, Pente when, Pentecostal, when the Pentecostal movement started, it did not start with prosperity. It started with an emphasis on the Holy Spirit. Mm. You know, Holy Spirit, tongues, gifts of the Spirit, the operation of the gifts of the Spirit, healing, miracles. That's how it started. Okay? The prosperity gospel came later on. It came later on. It actually came from the faith movement. The faith movement. All right? The faith movement which is what usually, for lack of a better word, it is called the name it and claim it. Name it and claim it. Name it and claim it. All right? And then from the name it and claim it, you sow a seed to get it. You sow a seed to get it. And then it grew into other things. And then, of course, the Pentecostals got involved with it, just like many other uh, branches of the Christendom got involved with it. It will, even, it will even surprise you to know that even the conservative Christians even got involved with the prosperity thing, and it has gone across the board today. It's almost everywhere, you know, uh, and it's just because of, first of all, uh, because of the economic conditions of Africa. But like I also always tell my friends, any gospel that does not have a universal application is fraudulent. Any gospel that does not have a universal application is fraudulent because the gospel of Christ must affect the rich, the poor, the highly placed, the low placed, it must affect the market woman, it must affect the CEO, the multi billionaire the multi millionaire all of them must be affected by the same gospel. So when your gospel has respect for rich people, it's not the gospel of Christ. Because the rich and the poor must need the gospel. And if it's prosperity, the poor have prosperity, they don't need it. You see, so that's where prosperity can be the gospel. Because the poor don't need it. I was telling a pastor who always likes preaching prosperity in his church. I said, let's say, for example, tomorrow you're preaching prosperity and Bill Gates, you know, Dan Gote of Africa, uh, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, three of them walk into your service and you're preaching principles of prosperity. Will you continue? He said, no. I said, because this man will tell you, sit down, what you're talking, you don't even know it. We know it better. Dr. Paul Yonggi Cho in, in Seoul, Korea, Dr. Paul Yonggi Cho, and I'm sure we're conversant with him, pastored some time ago, the largest church in the whole world. Doctor, He started the church growth movement. Said one day he was preaching and a woman in his church who was so blessed by his ministry decided to invite her husband to attend this service. The husband kept telling her he won't come. She kept insisting, please come to our church. So after a while of pressure, the husband accepted and went to the service with her. On that particular Sunday, Dr. Paul Yonggi Cho began to preach... Um, began to preach philosophy. He was preaching philosophy and using Bible verses to back it. Not knowing that the husband of this woman is a professor of philosophy. So after the service, the wife asked her husband, wouldn't you want to meet my pastor? He said, I don't want to meet your pastor. He said, please, he's expecting you. He said, I don't want to meet him. He was very offended. So when they finally met Dr. Cho, and Dr. Yugi Cho gave the story himself, I heard it from him. And he said, when they finally met, he greeted him and Dr. Cho looked at him and said, I'm sure you were blessed in the service today. <laughs> and he said to him, I wasn't blessed. You just wasted my time. 
You brought me to this place to come and give me philosophy and you don't even know it. What you were teaching is not even philosophy 101. It was wrong. I'm a professor of philosophy. You are a man of God. Stay with your Bible. Leave philosophy for those of us who are experts in the field. And he said, you just wasted my time. And he walked away. What we're saying is a preacher must stick to the facts, must stick to the details of the gospel. Yes, no sir. additions, no subtractions. That's what we're talking about. So the prosperity gospel is not a gospel because it has respect for the rich. The rich don't need it. But the gospel of Christ must be needed by everybody. The poor must need it. The rich must need it. Everybody must need it. I mean, look at it. Joseph of Arimathea made himself a disciple of Jesus. The guy was a bourgeois. He was very rich. So that means what Jesus preached to him was not prosperity. What he preached to him was the gospel. So again, we've got to stay within the confines of the gospel and be doctrinally sound in communicating it. Powerful. Powerful. Um, if you have a question for the doctor, please just uh, the reaction button and put uh, your hand up and then I'll recognize you. Then you can ask your, your questions live. Um, I've still got a couple of questions that I have, but I just wanna allow everybody to get into the conversation. Um, some of doctor's teachings, if you're not aware, I think doctor is one of the hardest working men in ministry because on YouTube, um, I get notifications all the time that there's a special prayer service on Wednesday. There's a special prayer service on Friday. There's a service on Monday. It looks like they have a service every day in Nigeria. And I look at that, I'm like, wow. So if you want more of these teachings in depth, obviously we cannot do it in two hours. I'd recommend you to also subscribe to their YouTube channel, Dr. Abel Damina Ministries International. And they keep on uploading that channel with a lot of content where he delves deep into this stuff. Does anyone have and the, a question? And the contents are free. The contents are free. The content is also free. The content is also free. Um, before I ask my next question, is, does anyone have a question? Anything that they want to double click on that the doctor said? Anything that maybe you want to ask, maybe to, to get clarification? Um, yeah. This is your time. Just reaction button. Um, just press there and I'll recognize you. All right, maybe some people are still thinking about it. While they're still thinking, a doctor, here's the, the question from a pre-written question that came in as well from uh, uh, Pastor Kinosi. It says, since poverty, uh, I see people are just logging in. And uh, it's so sad because we're about to finish. Um, so many people are still logging in. Um, since poverty is deemed as shameful in African worldview, what are the ways that we can leave the prosperity gospel and cultivate poverty of spirit among believers, living in a culture which despises the notion of poverty. I'll ask the question again. We live in a culture that despises the notion of poverty. Since poverty is deemed as shameful in African worldview, what are the ways we can leave the prosperity gospel and cultivate a poverty of spirit in a culture that uh, despises the notion of poverty? When we preach the facts of the gospel in its purity, and we begin to emphasize the revelation of Jesus. Jesus is the equalizer. In Christ Jesus, there is no poor, there is no rich. Once people begin to embrace Christ, he equalizes all of us. And when you realize who you are in Christ, you are rich in Christ. Even if you don't have money, you are rich in Christ. You begin to understand your true worth, your true value. Jesus said, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. The scripture tells us, if your hope is only in this world, you are of all men most miserable. Look at the church in Revelation, you know, in the, in the book of Revelation. He said they have all that they need. They have a lot of money. And he said, because you think you are rich, you have all that you need, but you don't know that you are poor, you are wretched, you are naked, you are blind. Then it says, I counsel you to buy gold tried in fire. That means when we begin to emphasize the value of Christ, the value of having Christ, the fulfillment in Christ, the satisfaction in Christ, when we begin to emphasize our riches in Christ, our, our, our non-material blessings, yeah. everything that Christ has done for us, 
when a believer begins to discover himself in those realities, he is no more intimidated. He is no more ashamed. He doesn't feel inferior. He is no more, you know, shamed. He doesn't feel all of that because he is contented in his true identity in Christ Jesus. What the prosperity gospel does, which is very dangerous, is it defines people by, by, by material stuff. Okay, so you're not a big pastor if you don't have a big car. You're not a big pastor if you don't have designers. You're not a big pastor if you're not wearing a rich, a, an expensive wristwatch. So young people, when they see that, now they want to be among the rich pastors. So they begin to preach all kinds of nonsense in a B to get the money so they can also belong. That is the destruction that the prosperity, one of it, that it has done to our continent. But when we begin to emphasize the virtues of Christ, the life of God, what Christ has done in the believer, Jesus said, he that drinks of this water shall never thirst again. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He that eats of this bread will never hunger. When we begin to emphasize the virtues of having Christ, what the Bible calls the unsearchable riches of Christ, believers will come out with boldness. They will no more be bothered about what they have and what they don't have. Then you will begin to see true fulfillment in believers. And then you will find out that when believers are blessed materially, their heart is towards the kingdom. They want to take the little they need and whatever else they do not really need, they want to use it in pushing the gospel, in advancing the work of God. And then churches will begin to have the resources they need to evangelize, the resources they need to preach the gospel. And the word of the Lord will grow very big in Africa and it will multiply all over the place. That's what to do. Amen. Somebody said that the church in Africa is, um, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a mile wide, but an inch deep, which means we, we, we're growing in numbers, but we're not growing in, in the depth. Of no, depth. Um, no depth. No yeah. depth. Here in South Africa, uh, a doctor, we, we really um, do not know much. Uh, we hear about, we, we hear, you know, some, some preachers will come from Nigeria and come to South Africa and Frankly, to be honest with you, sometimes they, it doesn't have a very good image from us here. Can you tell us about yeah. the state of the church in Nigeria? Just give us a, um, uh, give us an overview, give us a, a temperature, give us an audit of the church as you see it in Nigeria, so that we get a sense here in South Africa of, you know, are they, is, it, is this prevalent um, in Nigeria, the prosperity gospel, or is it just a few that are that are preaching it? What I actually wanted to do, maybe in the next time we study, was to give you. Uh, to give you an examination of Pentecostal revivals in Nigeria and how it has spread all over the world. That's what I wanted to do for time, but maybe when we meet next. But the point is in Nigeria, we have numbers, but no depth of knowledge. There's a lot of all of these prosperity thing everywhere, all over the country. There are just a few of us that are preaching the true gospel of Christ all over the place. It's all about materialism, about making money, about greed about you know getting it at all costs doing everything to get it because people are defined by what they have not by who they are in christ jesus so there's that competition there's that greed there's that dissatisfaction and there's that pursuit for material stuff is big mm. and it's big because the churches are emphasizing it the churches are preaching it the churches are preaching it as the only proof of your christian life and you know what brother paul said brother yeah. paul said to timothy that anywhere there is a preaching of gain is godliness. He said, those people are destitute of the truth. He said, from such people, turn away. Yes. People that do not embrace the fact that godliness with contentment is great gain. Then he said, for it is certain that we brought nothing into this world. And it is certain that we will take nothing out of this world. So having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. It's a man of God. If you meet a man who prizes material wealth above the virtues of Christ, he say, turn, run away from him. Flee, F-L-E-E, -E. flee from such a person. So people that preach materialism and say that your true worth as a believer is measured by the things you have, they are people to run away from because they are corrupting the gospel of Christ. Sure, powerful. And on that, uh, just bringing it closer to home, um, can you give us, I know you said it a bit, but if you can double click and so some people might not know, you said it in your video, some of us have seen it, on your journey 
of how you planted the church and, and what happened because something happened that that turned you to start preaching the true gospel maybe just give us a bit of your journey of how you came to know the true gospel well again i i, I grew up preaching the word of faith word of faith you know I, I came from a pentecostal background and i began to preach the word of faith and all i learned was to preach the pentecostal way and uh, for lack of proper for lack of a better word what I mean by the Pentecostal way, it's, uh, you know, uh, what, what, what we call a proof texting, you know, where you just decide what you want to preach and then you look for verses of the Bible to back it up. That is majorly the way Pentecostals preach. And that's the way I was preaching. But I began to find dissatisfaction in my heart. I began to find dissatisfaction more and more. And at a point in my ministry, I thought I was done with all that I needed to do on earth. Maybe I should just die because I was no more happy doing ministry. I was no more satisfied. I lacked joy and fulfillment. Mm. That made me leave my church. I left the church for a month to just go and pray and seek God. And it is in that period of seeking the Lord that the Lord, you know, that I stumbled on a, a little book by Andrew Womack, just a very little book. The war is over. And I read just eight pages of that book, just eight pages, and that did the job for me. Within those eight pages, I saw things that were like the missing puzzle in my life. I stood up from that book and I went back into intensive study of the word. I gave myself to study the whole of that year. And from there, I came back to my church and I did a 30 day conference in my church. And in that 30 day of conference, I kept apologizing for things I thought that were not sound. And I was making adjustments and correcting things. And I told my church, if any of you feels offended by my transition, you are free to leave. You don't have to stay in church. You don't have to be here. You're free to go if you're not happy with the things I'm saying. And I'm not angry with you. I bless you. But this is what God has revealed to me to be the truth as against what I preached before. And then I began to preach it very loud. I began to preach it very loud. And I was all over my country preaching it and everywhere. And I have been preaching these and preaching it for years. A lot of people left our church. Over 60% of our members left. Immediately I started preaching the truth because they were not happy with the truth. They preferred the, the prosperity. They preferred the, the, the wrong gospel that I was preaching. I wasn't moved because I made up my mind that I was ready to lose our entire church. I was, a, I was ready to lose everybody and start afresh as long as I'm preaching the truth. But a few stayed back with me and I built that few. And today we have, we have raised a lot of disciples all over our church here in Aquaibom State. We have twice the number of people we had when I was preaching the wrong gospel. And more and more people are trooping into our church who are hungry for the truth of the gospel of Christ. And I brought a journalist to our church who has been working with me to do a lot of radio broadcasts. And he said to me, he never knew that Christians could run after the word of God like he has seen it in our church. People are just hungry for the truth. Mm. Everybody's learning. Everybody's growing. And there's a massive exodus of people coming in to learn, to be equipped. Disciples are being raised all over the world. But it was trying for me for a bit. It was trying because even our finances collapsed because I was no more taking tithes. I was no more taking all of those things. I just preached the truth of Christ and asked people to give generously to the work of God. So when I stopped all of that, our finances crashed. We couldn't meet up with bills anymore. It was trying for me, but I was persuaded about the truth of the gospel. I stayed with the truth of the gospel. And after a while, my people began to understand. The word of God began to grow. People began to mature. More people began to come in. And today, it is far, far better. You can't compare what we have now to what we had before. The impact of the word, the impact, lives change, people growing, people coming in. I do not have enough words to explain, but it's just a blessing. And I'm just glad that I obeyed God and I'm where I am today, seeing disciples raised all over the world. It's a blessing. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Can we all react with a hand of praise and a, a sharp sign wherever we are? That's just powerful. This is encouraging, brothers and sisters. In this time where the church is receiving so much flag from the world where people are saying that, uh, you know, the church has lost its way, praise God that there are men and women that are saying we are going to preach the true gospel. 
even if it means losing people. I see Brother Johannes is raising his hand. You can unmute yourself, brother, and ask a question. Brother Johannes, you can go ahead. Uh, sorry, unmute yourself first. Uh, you have, yes, thank you. All right. Uh, a question I will ask is, uh, with, with the way we Christians live, it is, uh, it is with thinking with comes, when it comes to money, using money, and at times we use it in such a way that uh, you live in this house, so you buy this car, wouldn't that doctor give the wrong impression to those that are looking on to see that, ah, this is one of those pastors as well. Look at what car he drives or look at his house. Because now we, we, we tend to live a righteous life, I would say, but now we use the money that God has given us in a manner that uh, maybe we say it blesses God or it, it, it brings God for people to see the blessings that God has given us, even physically, uh, uh, those things. What would you say concerning that, uh, doctor? Well, again, you know, the Bible teaches moderation, 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 you know, moderation. Um, you can be so blessed financially, but you can choose, you can choose not to flaunt it. You can choose to use it very discreetly because you are, you are an example. People are looking up to you. Poor people are looking up to you. Rich people are looking up to you. Nobody's are looking up to you. Somebody's are looking up to you. I mean, those I have and those I don't have, they are all members of your church and they're looking up to you. And then by the time you start showing them that you have too much, and then you come to them and say, support the work of God, it doesn't add up. So that's why you've got to live in moderation. You know, a man of God must be moderate, must be sick, be discreet in the things he has. There's nothing wrong in a man of God buying a jet if he can afford it. There's nothing wrong, but we don't flaunt it. We use it for the purpose for which it is purchased effectively, you know, and just discreetly use it to, you know, achieve the purpose for which it is bought. So again, moderation is the word in all things. We must be moderate, even in our dressing, you know, um, uh, and all of that. It's moderation because when the church is not moderate, that's why the world says a lot of things against the gospel we preach, you know. So if I am a pastor and I have resources, of course, Instead of buying 10 cars, I will buy one or two. I use the money of eight cars to advance the kingdom of God, to be a blessing to others. I always say to people in our church, even if you have one car, how many seats can you occupy at one time? If you have a big bed in your house, how much space can you occupy on that bed? So again, you know, we must be so kingdom minded that our affections are set on things above and not on things below on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So again, moderation is the right word for it. Mm. I think it is Isaac Solomon who made a prayer to say, neither give me poverty nor riches, uh, something to that effect. Uh, moderation, yeah. Moderation, yeah. moderation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, doctor, th there might be a pastor who's here and who's uh, maybe saying, you know what, I recognize that what I've been preaching, uh, similar to you, I was not preaching the right thing. Um, you know, um, I, was, I was telling people that if they sow the seed that they could get, um, you know, something 100% return or however that is taught and all of that thing. Um, you made a statement, a preacher is not supposed to innovate, but yep. to excavate the scriptures yep. in the bead yep. to find out what the author said. Expand on that just, um, I know it's, you, you can take an hour, but just in, in a minute, just give us some, what, are, what is the ways that, um, how can those people preach the scriptures now, now that they are convicted and they know that maybe what they've been preaching is wrong? What are some of the principles? I will use the story of Apollos in the Bible, in the book of Acts chapter 18. The Bible says Apollos was a man of God. He, was, he, was, he, he preached the word of God mightily mightily. He was known mightily all over the land as a preacher. And one day Aquila and Priscilla sat down and listened to Apollos preach. And at the end of his preaching, they called him aside and said, gentlemen, that's not the way it is preached. What you're preaching doesn't sound right. 
And the Bible says, Apollos, uh, yeah, Apollos was humble enough. He humbled himself, went to Taquila and Priscilla. They took time and taught him the word of God more perfectly, more perfectly. And the Bible says he went back to the Jews and convinced them mightily that Jesus was the Christ. So the emphasis of Apollos after being trained moved from just displaying knowledge to accurate Bible teaching. Excavating scripture is sound exegesis. Innovating is superimposing our nuances, our ideologies, and our feelings on scripture, which is corruption, which is, ad which is adulteration of the scripture. We are not to add, we are just to go into the mind of the author and teach the people what the author intended to communicate. Like I said in the opening of my teaching tonight, the Bible can never mean today what it never meant when it was first written. It can never mean, and there is a consistency in the message of the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. So if a pastor is seeking for how to preach the true gospel, I will advise him, this is my sincere advice. He can go to YouTube and get my teachings on the Old and the New Testament in Christ. The Old and the New Testament in Christ. That will give the pastor an overview of the entire message of Christ in the whole Bible. Old and New Covenant in Christ. It's about 36 hours of teaching. The Old and the New Covenant in Christ. When he's through with that, I would recommend for him one of my books, The New Testament Ministry. The New Testament Ministry. New wine in new wine skin. The New Testament ministry. That book will show you how to transition your church from what you were preaching before to what you're supposed to be preaching now. It will share with you my own personal story, what I did, how I did, what a New Testament ministry is, what a New Testament ministry is not. There's another book I recommend, Life Before the Cross and Life After the Cross. It is not the same. If the way people live before the cross is the same way people are to live after the cross, then the cross is useless. The cross of Jesus changed everything. So that book deals with life before and life after the cross. These are resources. And I don't write, I don't write inspirational books. All my books are doctrinal. They are all exegesis. Amen. And they, they cover a wide range of subjects. I've written over 30 books so far. They cover a wide range. But you can get one of my books that can cover a, a good deal of subjects. It is the Christocentric Meal. It's a book of about 1,200 pages. It covers so many areas. It covers so many areas of teaching. And it's, 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 it's a book of sound exegesis. All right, the Christocentric Meal. These are materials and resources that are theologically sound that a preacher can begin to feed on to be able to feed his congregation and grow them from where they are to where God wants them to be. Amen. Um, and uh, I'll give over uh, towards the end to Pastor Wafana who's gonna talk about, cause the part of the vision of the Academy of Theology is to have such books, such material available on our shores. So we're still working on a way to have his material available here so that we can be here, the church in South Africa can be edified by his material. There's a question, uh, doctor, who are your influences? <clears throat> who are the people that influence you? I think you said, you, is it Andrew Womack, if I heard you right? Who are other people that maybe influenced you to your, your theology? Kenneth Hagin. Kenneth Hagin. Okay. E.W. Kenyon. Would you put, if I may ask, would you, would you uh, regard Kenneth Hagin as a prosperity preacher? Uh, Prosper uh, Ken Hagin was 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 a theologian. He was a theologian to a great degree. It's just that some people that followed him abused what he preached. Okay, so it's uh, it's it's, uh, it's these people that have influenced you. Okay, um, we have we have about. And don't forget, don't Sorry. forget. Please continue. Don't forget, don't forget that um, I have a, a diploma in theology first degree in theology, second degree in theology. I have two PhDs in theology. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we have about two to th 
three minutes left. If anybody uh, wants to ask a question, Mbali, do you have a question? Good evening, Doctor. Evening. Um, so what I'd like to know um, is when you say, you, as a Christian, we should live in moderate, you get a situation where one is born in, in wealth and is accustomed to that lifestyle and it can be maintained and you get your trust fund kids. You know, you, you just born in wealth and then you become a Christian, you're born in it to become a Christian maybe in your 20s. How do you then uh, say, how do you balance that to say, now I'm a Christian, then I'm gonna step off wealth. Or, or, and, and then people looking out would say, he became a Christian, then the next thing, life went down. And the second question, second question, I understand that the scripture, the book of Luke, give and it shall be given unto you a full measure, pressed down, well shaken and overflowing. And then it, it could be taken in context. What is the correct context of the overflowing? I mean, if it's pressed down, shaken and still overflowing, it, it talks of abundance. So how, what is the context of that scripture? And okay. knowing that it is okay. Jesus who said those words, uh, okay. How does that it explain to the person? Thank you. What's yeah, thanks. To I don't know if I'm clear. Yeah, you're clear. Uh, sure. doctor. Yeah, very clear. The first one is if somebody was born in wealth, right. um, and so how does he how does he live a moderate life? The truth is, when you start feeding on Christ, and you start feeding on Christ and feeding on the Word of God, <laughs> Christ has a way of bringing you to a place where you decrease for him to increase. Amen. The life of Christ begins to affect you. Suddenly, you begin to be touched by people around you. You want to be a blessing to people around you. So even if you don't step down, people will find out that you are using your wealth to be a blessing to other people around you. Do you understand? So apart from moderation, knowing Christ kills greed. It kills selfishness. It brings you to a place of selflessness where you live to be a blessing to everybody around you. And the problem with wealth is when it is greed. The problem with wealth is when it generates selfishness. The problem with wealth is when it makes you feel like you're better than everybody. But when Christ comes in and you begin to feed on Christ, Christ balances you out eventually because your values will change all of a sudden. Your focus will change. Your appetite will change. That's what Christ does to you. That's why a man like the tax collector will stand up and say, everybody I have cheated, I will give you times four. He distributed his wealth. That's what the life of Christ does to a person. Now, Luke chapter 6, where you quoted. Remember, it says, give, it shall be given good measure, praise and shaking together, run over shall men, not, not shall God, shall men. That is how men give. Men give because you gave them. If you don't give them, they will not give to you. If you look at the pretext and the post-text, he was first of all talked about how men give. You know, if you are merciful, men will be merciful to you. If you are kind, men will be kind to you. If you give, men will give to you. Good measure. Then he now says, but your father in heaven gives to those who give and gives to those who don't give. He makes his son to shine on the good and on the bad. He makes his rain to fall on the good and on the bad. That means your father doesn't wait for you to give before he gives you. It's not like a man. Men give because you give them. But God doesn't give because you gave him. He gives even without you giving to him. Because that is his character. His nature is that he's a giver. He gives to the thankful. He gives to the unthankful. He gives to the good. He gives to the bad. Just he makes the, the sun to shine on the good and on the bad. So that Luke chapter 6, verse 38 is not talking about prosperity. It's actually giving us a contrast between the character of God versus the character of men. That men will only give when you give to them. Even though many churches use that scripture for collecting offering, which is actually an abuse of that scripture. Because what that verse is talking about in context is not for collecting offering. It's just giving a contrast between the character of God and how men behave. Men give because you give to them. God doesn't give because you give him. Actually, God gave you before you even knew how to give. The Bible tells us God commended his son to his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, 
Christ died for us. So that, that's what that scripture thank is you. talking about. Thank you, thank you, Doctor. Sure, there is so much to talk about. Um, even what Mbalo was asking, and I see somebody in the chat is asking for you to explain Luke 19 verse 13, of which unfortunately we don't have time for. I think we need, can everybody agree that we need another webinar? Because I haven't even asked him about um, issues of uh, healing and uh, what his views are. And there's just so many things that I had uh, wanted to ask, but uh, obviously we are limited in terms of time. We just wanted to introduce uh, his ministry to, to other brothers. Can you all join me in just thanking him by reacting with sharp science or clap science, just thanking him for his time uh, with us tonight. This is just such a powerful, powerful time, powerful, powerful stuff that we, we've received here. Uh, somebody asked, who is your spiritual father? Maybe in, in just quickly, uh, I don't know if you believe in the concept. If you do, who is your spiritual father? Maybe you can answer it quickly, um, uh, be, uh, uh, doctor. My spiritual father was Pastor Ayo Orishi Jaffo, but when I began to preach the true gospel of Christ, he defathered me. So since he <laughs> defathered me, I have been without a father. father. <laughs> uh, that's a new word that I've learned tonight. He defathered. <laughs> Yeah, people so, but other people. <laughs> I have a few people around me who, you know, form my 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 accountability system. People like uh, Bishop Michael Konko, you know, um, I, I I defer to them and I listen to them and uh, you know I relate with them. So that's the way it is. <clears throat> Powerful. Um, um, if Pastor Wafana is here, I'm going to hand over to him. He's going to give some announcements from Academy of Theology side and just tell us. Because some of you might want to know where do we go for now? What is next? Uh, we just want to announce that to you. But uh, we just thank God for, for you, sir. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your ministry. Thank you for your labor. You've been in ministry for more than 40 years. And um, you know the boldness you did to change what you were preaching, to preach the true gospel has inspired us here in South Africa. We're sharing yes. your tips. And we are, we are just so motivated to hear that there are men of God that are preaching the gospel, even in Nigeria. Um, you thank know, because we, we people might not have a positive view of it, but we thank God that hearing your voices, it might change some of these views that we have. So I just want to hand over to, to um, Pastor Bafana, if you can hear me, to just give some announcements on uh, what's coming next. Praise God. Uh, thank you for the teaching, uh, Doctor, and uh, meet again. Um, because uh, uh, power lost and connection, some of the hearing, but this announcement is that go to the Academy of Theology page in Facebook like that, and you will see everything that we will put up there. And our next Zoom meet February, uh, where we speak about deliverance, and then we'll also advertise on our WhatsApp and also on the Facebook. I'm not in the good space now. We have uh, 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 who you hear me clearly. And um, if anyone can go to our Facebook page, is the Academy of is the T O A the A T O uh, everything. Yeah. Speakers, doctor again to to take another topic or to explain topic because it was two three hours to expand doctor thank you very much and thank you very much to everyone who is here uh with us over the zoom over to you pastor Spoo. thank you everyone we've recorded the if you can just leave your emails if you wanted the recording we can send it to you via email um you can just leave your email in the chat box but thank you for attending i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna close uh -huh. in prayer and then and we'll... don't, don't forget, just before you close, uh, yes, Pastor sir. Sibus, too, yes, sir. Uh, uh, Pastor James, James Bayana is here. If you can just say hello, uh, I want him to connect. James Bayana, yes. sorry. If you can just yes, greet yeah. everyone, because uh, we need to connect here in South Africa, those uh, yeah. who have uh, preaching the true gospel. So I would love to connect with Chuck, Pastor James Bayana if you are here. Is he still here? Pastor James Bayana, I believe... Um, Pastor Spoon? Yes, sir. I must speak to Pastor Sorry. Okay. 
I think your connection Maybe. is not that good. Yes, connection is not good. Okay, that's okay. All right. No, it's okay. Um, uh, just say something about him, uh, doctor. Oh, Reverend James Bayana is a very sound. Very, very, very sound. He's in Johannesburg. And, uh, he's my contact person in Johannesburg. Yes. And, um, you know, I, I wanted him to, wanted you guys to relate with him. And I asked him to be in the conference tonight. But oh. I'm sure after the conference, you guys will have a way of connecting and just build relationships. Amen. You know. Yeah. We'll, we'll search and connect with you. Some of my pastors are also here. Some of my pastors are also here. Pastor Shepard in Johannesburg is here. And Pastor Moss in Botswana is also here. Okay. And a few of our people in Power City, they are, they are on the conference tonight. I saw them here, you know, in the conference. Powerful. Um, powerful. We'll, we'll certainly connect with all those who are here, because the kingdom of God is very broad, it's very large. We are all called to preach the gospel. We want gospel preachers in these last days, people who are serious about Christ, serious about telling people the truth. And so we want to connect with each and every one of you. So I'm going to pray, and then we'll close the meeting. Father, we thank you for this time we've had. Baba, I'm so encouraged to hear about such men. Uh, um, I remember Paul's words. He says, I have no one of like mind, like Timothy, who has a genuine interest for you. And, and, and I sense the genuineness and a, and, and a track record of, of gospel preaching. Thank you for using him in all this time. Thank you for, for introducing us to him. Thank you for, for, for his faithfulness over the years. And I just wanna pray for, 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 for his ministry in Nigeria. May you continue to use him to stay on the path. And may you continue to strengthen him, oh God, that, that the gospel will spread in Nigeria and all over Africa that there will be servants, there will be a remnant rising up, a remnant that is, is tired of the status quo that says we want Christ. We wanna preach the true gospel. We wanna go back to the old paths. May we, oh God, connect. May you use, oh Father, us to be able to, to get the gospel out there to a, to a dying nation, to a, to a hopeless nation. Even as we think of the times we live in, people dying around us, people are hopeless. They need the true gospel. So may you infuse, oh God, your spirit in us Oh God, may you may you use us, oh God, to be able to, to preach this word along with others who are also soldiers in the same field. Thank you so much for this time. And we pray that, oh God, you may just uh, use this even platform to grow it, that other people may be aware that there are servants of God who are still preaching the true gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank Pastor you Spoo. for joining us. Pastor Spoo. Pastor Spoo. Yes. Pastor Spoo. Yes. Pastor Spoo. Just to say that those who need uh, uh, Dr. Demand books, we will get them and uh, they will contact us and at inf info at uh, the deal and we'll get those books and we'll transfer to them and they will call us. All those who are interested in getting his books, we'll supply Bali, those materials. Bali, please write the email again. Just for I, I can't see it. I know you did, but please write it because I saw people talk. Okay. Where people can connect if they want his books, we'll try and get his books down here in South Africa, uh, in connection with the, the the other guys from from um, from the branches from Power. Uh, so we, we're really excited about that. But thank you everyone for for joining. Sorry, would you, I must say that if they could just send us blank emails for the newsletter as well, so that we could have them on our database. So right. each topic that we get through, we send you our newsletter. Awesome. Thank oh. you. Thank you, everyone. The meeting is yeah, We'll just continue here for those who want to stay. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Oh. Thank you. Oh, yes, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. Good night. Yes, we... yes, I wanted to ask um, where can you invite you? Uh, sorry, who am I speaking to? Just to identify yourself. Oh, it's no Casey too. I think it's the name of my device. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. My, yes. my question was, where can I get uh, the, the where can I get the recorded video like okay, for this session? If you can leave your email with us, we'll send it to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, so they can also our Facebook page. I think so. 
Yeah, we'll have a YouTube page soon and we put it up. Yeah, and then also YouTube. Thank you. Yes, I'm not. Okay, sir. Powerful. And uh, uh, I'm good, man. You? Ah, uh, no. Good to, good to hear from you. Uh, uh, good to see you. Thank okay. you for the session. Okay. Anyone who has questions for Academy of Theology, you can ask it. We are we are available here. Uh, those who like to leave the session can leave. Pastor Bu, I I went here to answer the um the last question I had. My laptop just froze. Hey, I missed it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but I'll get it on recording. I'm asking you, what is the name of the Facebook page? Can you just write it on the chat box? Okay. I need today's video. Yeah, we'll we'll try and put it up, Femi, um, on YouTube, and we'll send it to you by email, so you'll get it, sir. Wow. <laughs> asking you say hello. Yes, uh, Nokia C2. Yes. Yes. Oh yes, I wanted it like that. Exactly. Will it be like on the other theme today? Sure, you are cutting, sir. If you can ask that again, I'm not hearing you clearly. Oh, I was asking that exactly of the video because even on the 20, uh, 29th and 30th of, no, of December, I tried to search for the